over here killing it on the mic. You know, Brandon, Brandon asked me to do that, uh, to do that rap for you all, but I just, I just couldn't do that and preach. It would have been too much. So thankfully, Brandon stepped in and he pre or he, he, he rapped and preached at the same time. He said, I think it's time I got some answers. And this time, I'm going to listen. Be prepared to answer some questions. Hope this causes no friction. I need this bond in my life, and you can say that it was missing. To continue on in this conversation, that's really up to your decision. Tell me all the things that I need to change. I don't want your answers to be bleak. I'm sitting at your table, Father. It's your turn to speak. Preach. You know, let's get into the word of God this morning, amen? Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Thank you so much, Brandon, for that. I think if I would have done it, I would have for sure destroyed the church. There would have been nobody left. I'd be here by myself. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17, it's time to get preached to by the Lord. In verse 17 here, it says, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but being made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into the heavens and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. You know, here Peter is talking to a group of first century Christians and he alludes to the Old Testament flood in the days of Noah. And he goes, man, back then there was only eight people that were saved through the waters of the flood. You know, a lot of times when we, when we come into Christianity or when we read the Bible, we have all these different perspectives on how things are. And part of God and his word and that the purpose of his word is to reorient our perspective so that we have God's perspective on life. Yeah. And for a lot of us, we would, we would kind of look back on the flood and we would look back on how God destroyed the world and, and we would see the waters as a tool that God uses in a destructive way to destroy and yet the perspective of the Bible is quite different. The Bible says that God didn't use water to destroy the world, but really he used water to save eight people from an already destroyed world. You with me? And so here he goes, just like it was back in Noah's time, so too in our New Testament times, God uses water in a symbolic way, the flood water symbolizes baptism. He uses water to save us also from the corruption of this world. And this is not, it's not a removal of dirt from the body. So it's not like when somebody gets baptized, they're just, you know, trying to scrub off all the sin underwater. And, and, and when you come up out of the water, all the sin is left in the water. That, that's not what's happening at baptism. At Romans 6, the Bible says that we are buried in water. When we do that, we're dying with Christ when we are raised back out of the water, we're resurrecting with Christ. And so we're literally participating in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And, and I find it interesting that the point in time that the Bible says that we're saved is the single most controversial thing in all of Christianity, baptism. And it would make sense, of course, because Satan doesn't want us to be clear-minded. He wants us to be confused. And yet it's interesting right here because as God foreshadows baptism in the New Testament times through this Old Testament event, the flood, you, you got to kind of make that comparison and ask, well, after baptism, what are we supposed to do? You see, just like Noah survived the flood, that represents baptism. 
when we come up out of the waters of baptism, what now? And, and you, have to, you have to kind of sympathize with that because wasn't it like that when you studied the Bible? You study the Bible and you're going through it and you're changing and you're repenting and you're trying to become a disciple. And then, and then you finally reach the waters of baptism. You get baptized and you come out of the waters and you're so fired up because you've been forgiven and you finally made it. You became a disciple. But then there's the question, what do I do now? In fact, our first follow-up study with people after they get baptized is after baptism, now what? And so since Peter is correlating these two events, we got to go back to the Old Testament and look at what happened with Noah right after the flood. Let's go to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. This is right after the flood. And in verse 13, I'm going to have to move this mic back a little bit. In verse 13, it says, By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year. <laughs> so he's right up there with Tony, amen? <laughs> 601, wow. He's got a lot of experience to offer. It says, Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark. You know, I think that God had to tell Noah to come out because I don't think Noah wanted to come out of that ark. He's like, man, I don't know what's going on out there, but I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm just going to hide myself and shut myself up in this thing. And God goes, no, 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 it's safe. Come out. He says, bring out, in verse 17, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So he goes, okay, no, I, I want you to come out of the ark. And you know all those, those animals that I put in the ark? He goes, yes, I've lived with them for the last 40 days and 40 nights. He goes, okay, now, now I want you to bring them out. And then once they come out, I want you to help them, so just kind of scatter them around so that they can go out and increase and multiply on the earth. These were the only living things left right there. And so he brings them out, and, and they go out, and they start multiplying and being fruitful and increasing in number. And then we come to chapter 9, verse 1. It says, then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. He goes, not only do I want the animals to multiply and reproduce after their own kind and, and fill the earth, but as humans, I want you to go out and multiply, increase in number, and fill the whole earth. Verse 7. As for you, here he is again saying the same thing, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. And so he goes once again, he goes, no, I, I want to make sure you really understand what you got to do. Don't, don't just sit around and let your generation die off without reproducing and multiplying because then the end of humanity will occur. But I want you instead to, to go and be fruitful, increase in number, and multiply on the earth. Well, remember, Peter is correlating the flood with baptism. And so what did Noah do after the flood? What are we to do after we're baptized? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Be fruitful, increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. You know, for the first several generations, these people absolutely did that. In chapter 9 and verse 18, it says they were scattered over the whole earth. In chapter 10 and verse 32, as it goes through all the different tables of nations, so the nations that were created through this scattering and through this multiplication, it says, from these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. And so they were totally obedient to God's call to go out and multiply, be fruitful, and increase in number. But then you come to chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech, as people moved eastward, they found the plain in Shinar and settled there. 
They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. They, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, is if one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so just in a few generations in, as Noah and his sons were scattering around the earth and, and being fruitful and multiplying and trying to fill the earth, we find that there's a group of people right here, as they moved eastward, they found the plain, and in disobedience to God's word, they settled in Shinar. You know, as I was thinking about this, I was just like, man, this is kind of intense. I mean, here's a, here's a big group of people, and collectively... They all seem to have decided at once to disobey the call of God. I just thought, like, how does that, how does that happen? You know what I mean? Like, like, it's one thing for one person to just go, yeah, I don't feel like doing it, and, and to walk away from the group. But, but it's another thing when the group as a whole goes, you know, I just don't want to obey the word of God anymore. And I was reading this, and I was trying to figure it out, and it occurred to me that it, it all started in verse 3. They said to each other, Come, let, let's make some bricks and bake them thoroughly. You know, th this is kind of just where it starts. Like, hey, guys, let's, let's go bake some bricks. You know, like, it's, it's fun. We're just going to get some mud and put it together. And it's so cool because we can, we can turn these bricks, these, these things of mud, into bricks. And it's like we're building our own rocks. At, at first, it was probably just like a hobby. You know, like, you don't want to be too focused or, or too, you know, just serious about God. You got to have, like, a hobby and have some balance in life. And so, so he goes, hey, why don't, we just, why don't we just start baking bricks? I mean, it's fun. It's just something fun that we can do together as a family. We can just bake bricks together. And they started saying this to each other. And then from there, it started to go to verse 4. Well, they said, well, come. We've got to do something with all these bricks. Let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. So it started off as a pretty innocent thing. It started baking bricks. Not a bad thing in and of itself. And then one thing led to another, and pretty soon they were more and more focused on building a tower and a city for themselves than they were at scattering out for the word of God. And isn't that how Satan always works? He always gets you to kind of compromise a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And before you know it, you find yourself doing something completely different than what God has called you to do from the very beginning. In fact, I read a story about like uh, how Eskimos back in the day used to kill wolves. And it's a pretty sobering story. What they'd do is they'd take this really sharp knife and they would stick it in blood, leave it outside so the blood would freeze on the knife. And they'd do the same thing over and over until there's this just thick, thick slab of blood on this knife. And they would go and they'd plant this knife in the ground so that the blade is up with the, the blood around it and stick it in there. And, and the wolves would come and they would see the blood and they'd start licking the blood. Now, at first, the, the blade of the knife is not exposed. So they're just tasting the blood. And as they're licking it, because the blood is cooled, their, their tongue starts to get cooler and cooler. And eventually their tongue is numbed. But they can still taste the flavor of the blood. And they keep licking it. And as the blood melts, eventually the blade is exposed. And now the blood that they're tasting is not the blood that's frozen to the knife, but it's their own blood. And they lick it and they lick it and it tastes so good. And eventually they bleed out and end up killing themselves because they decided to lick that knife. And I think that that's true with the things that we know we shouldn't do as Christians. And I think that sometimes Satan does that with things that we know we should do as Christians. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, I, I got to go to the cross. This is what God wants me to do. This is how I'm going to bring salvation to the world. And the Bible says that Peter took him aside and says, no, 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 Jesus, you should never have to do all that. That's like being radical, dude. You're, you're too serious about this whole thing with the cross. And it says that Peter began to rebuke Jesus. 
Jesus, don't, 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 don't do this. This is too extreme. Have some balance in life. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Which is powerful because just before that, he called Peter the rock. So Peter was feeling very bipolar that day. He was a rock one second, and now he's Satan right now. But what Jesus, when he, when he heard Peter's words, he didn't look at the man. He looked at the powers behind the man. He looked at the spiritual force that was influencing Peter to say something that's that foolish. And sometimes we can say things like that to each other. Like, hey, stop being so extreme. Stop being so focused on God. Like, you got to have a little bit more balance. Don't, don't go crazy with this whole Christianity thing. And we can prevent people from really having a wholehearted relationship with God. And so right here, they start building in the city of Shinar. And it's interesting because everything in the Bible is, is put there for a reason. And the Holy Spirit says that they used brick instead of stone. And I thought about that and go, well, why did, why did the Holy Spirit kind of put that in there for us? Well, it's because brick is something that we make. Right? Like this is something that's man-made. You just collect some mud, put it in a little form, and let it dry out in the sun. It's cool. It's fun. It's fun to baking bricks. But stone is something that God's made. And so already what he's saying right here is that this, this is not building for God. This is building for man. You know, we in the church believe that church is not simply a social club or a bunch of meetings that you kind of go to or, or routines that you sort of prescribe to. Right here in the church, we believe that we are a movement full of disciples that believe in scattering over the face of the entire world, planting seeds and planting God's word. Are you with me? Yeah. We, we believe that and we embrace that. And yet here's a fact that I think is proven right here in the scripture and has been proven throughout history. That when a movement stops moving for God, it no longer is a movement for God. It now has become a monument for men. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening right here in Shinar. They settle there, and it's no longer about building something for God. It's now about building this thing to make our name for ourselves. But here's what's so powerful. That even in their disobedience, God looks down at them, and in verse 6 he says, If as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. He goes, man, you know, what they're doing is totally disobedient, but you know, their unity is very powerful. And that's the truth, that unity can be a powerful thing. But unity is not a good thing or a bad thing. It can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what that unity is used for. And right here, they were unified, and there was power in that unity. But they were unified in their disobedience to God. You know, it's once been said, the unity of a nation's spirit and will are worth far more than the freedom of the spirit and will of the individual. And that the higher interest involved in the life of the whole must here set the limits and lay down the duties of the interests of the individual. Yo, that's an incredible quote. Guess who wrote that? Adolf Hitler. You see, unity can be used for good or unity can be used for bad. And right here, God looks at the unity of the people and he goes, man, they're going to accomplish what they set out to do. But what, I, what they're set out to do is not what I want them to do. You know, one of the things that I, I think is dangerous as a church is when we start to choose unity or relationship over obedience to the word of God. And, and I believe that every culture has cultural sins. You know, even in the Bible, in uh, Titus 1, 2, 12, it says Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. I don't think the Cretans were very fired up about that scripture. Oh, man, that, that's like a generalization right here, man. How are you going to classify me like that? And yet, what he's saying right there is not that every person in Crete was a liar or every person in Crete was an evil brute or that every person in Crete was a lazy glutton. But these were cultural sins that existed in their culture there on the island of Crete. And, and so, too, I think that every culture around the world has their version of cultural sins. And I think here in Canada, one of our cultural sins is, is we don't like to rock the boat. Yeah. We, we just want to be neutral. And somehow when people get behind the car, that all disappears. 
But when they're outside the car, we don't want to we don't want to rock the boat with anybody. We just want to get along with everybody. You know, everybody's awesome and they have their way, I have my way, but let's just accept it all. And sometimes I think that that comes into the church and we can start choosing unity or relationship over obedience to the word of God. And let me tell you something. You can be absolutely totally unified and still be unified in disobedience. Now, we have got to be unified, but we need to make sure that we're unified in doing what God has called us to do. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, I believe that one of the things that separates true biblical Christianity from most denominational churches around the world is simply found at the second part of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We know that in Jesus' great commission... He called us to go and make disciples of all nations. Your job's not done then. Then you got to baptize them. Right? And then your job is done. No. No. Then he says, and then teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. I think there's a big difference between teaching everything that Jesus commanded and teaching people to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. You see, a lot of groups out there teach what the Bible says. They read the scriptures and they read the Bible. And sometimes that's how people can feel. It's like, how could this be wrong? At least, I mean, we're studying the Bible every day, every week in church. But there's a difference, again, between teaching the scriptures and teaching people to obey the scriptures. And sometimes what stops us from teaching each other to obey the scriptures is that we don't want to lose the relationship. We don't want to stir or rock the boat. We don't want to stir up conflict in our relationships. And yet that's exactly what the Bible requires if we're going to obey the word of God. And so right here, God looks at what's happening right here in Shinar. He goes, they're unified. They're going to accomplish everything. And so he decides to come down and he confuses their language. And so really this is the origin of different world languages. And through that, he scatters them. And this place, Shinar, becomes known as Babel. Babel just simply means confused. So if you're confused this morning, you're Babel. (laughs) And sometimes when people are confusing, they're babbling. Right? Well, what people don't realize is that, yes, Babel means confused, but Babel itself becomes known as Babylon. And Babylon throughout history becomes a symbol of worldliness in contrast to God's kingdom, God's church. And time and time again throughout history, people have settled in Shinar. They have settled in Babylon. And that's the title of our lesson this morning. They settled in Shinar. We know at this point in Genesis 11, historically, that the people who started to take over and to run Babylon, so to speak, were the Amorites. In 1595, we're going to go a little history lesson right here. In 1595, the Hittites rise up and they control Babylon. Now, this is pretty cool. The Hittites are mentioned over 50 times in the Bible, but they're not mentioned anywhere else in all secular history. And so for many, many years, critics of the Bible slam the Bible for bringing up these people, the Hittites, without there being any historical record or archaeological record of them ever having existed. And and that was like that for a long, long time until 1906. In 1906, a guy, an archaeologist named Hugo Winkler, discovered the ruins of the Hittite people in Turkey. And yet the Bible is the only book in history that records their existence. Is that pretty cranking or not? In 1911, the Assyrians rise up and they control Babylon. And we know in 722 BC, the Assyrians invade northern Israel. And from that point on in the history books, northern Israel ceases to exist. Well, what happened to all those people? Some of them were resettled in Samaria, but overall, most of them settled in Shinar. They settled in Babylon. Later on, in 609 BC, the, the, the Assyrians are wiped out by Nebuchadnezzar the Chaldean. And from 609 to 539, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire becomes a very prominent empire. But in 606 BC, they invade Judah, southern Israel. 
And they take those people into captivity. And they were in captivity, according to Jeremiah, for 70 years. At the end of that 70-year period, Cyrus of Persia comes in and wipes out Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And the Persians are now in control of Babylon. And Cyrus the Great releases the Israelites to go back into Jerusalem and to build up God's temple. And you would think that they were pretty fired up to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And yet only a small portion of the people actually left. And we know that because books like Nehemiah records that Nehemiah was still in Babylon. And books like Esther record that they continued on in Babylon for some time. But although their people went back to build up God's kingdom, the, the temple of God, they settled in Shinar, they settled in Babylon. The Persians ruled for some time. And eventually the Greeks in 331 B.C. And Babylon was so beautiful that even Alexander the Great stayed there once he conquered it. It's recorded in history that he died in Nebuchadnezzar's palace in 323 B.C. And so over and over, people got to Babylon and they just stayed there in Babylon. Why? Well, Isaiah 13, 19 records that Babylon was considered the jewel of kingdoms. Which is why Daniel, when referring to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2, says, O king of kings. Because Babylon was considered the most, the most awesome place on earth. It was so beautiful. Rich in all kinds of resources. Even to this day, it's rich in resources because Babylon is located in Iraq. Where there are tons of natural resources. You with me? And so the people got there and they settled there. Later on in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter refers to Rome as Babylon. Why? Because the Roman Empire had become worldly and Babylon was a symbol for worldliness. And throughout the book of Revelation, over and over, God dictates his judgment on it for Rome persecuting the Christians, but he dictates his judgment on, quote, Babylon. You see, constantly throughout history and throughout the Bible, people settled in Shinar. They settled in Babylon. They settled for the world rather than the kingdom of God. You know, isn't it heartbreaking when you see a woman who's beautiful and talented settling for the wrong guy? Don't you hate that in, in, in society? You know, you, you, see, you see somebody that's beautiful and could do so well in their life and they, they settle for a guy who's just a derelict? I mean, that's what happened to my wife. And your heart just goes out like, man, she could do so much better. What is she thinking? And it just breaks your heart. Or when somebody graduates with a degree, a summa cum laude, valedictorian, whatever, from their college or high school or whatnot, and they end up working at McDonald's or some of you are like, man, they could do so much better with their life. And it breaks our hearts when people settle. And yet so often, so, uh, so, 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 so frequently people settle in Shinar. They settle for the world when God wants to do so much with their lives. The question I have for you this morning is, are you settling for the world? Are you settling for Shinar? I've just got two quick points this morning. Number one, if you're not gathering, you're scattering. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Some of us don't like history. You guys just tuned out with that whole section right there. Welcome back. Welcome back to church. Welcome back to the Bible. And the Bible is history. Now, it's not just history, but it is history. Not some fairy tale, not a bedtime story. This is a book of history that means to be applied to our life. And a lot of the things that are written down in the past were recorded for us to take lessons from. In Luke chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible says Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left the man who had been mute, spoke, and the crowd was amazed... But some, said, some of them said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then... They will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. 
But when someone stronger over, attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. You know, here we find that Jesus is just, you know, he's kind of going along and he sees this guy who's possessed by a, a spirit or a demon. And, and this particular demon was making this guy mute. He couldn't speak. And, and so Jesus cast the demon out of the man. And the Bible says when the demon left him, the man who was mute began to speak. And isn't that what happens when Satan leaves your life? When you're pure or impure, you're now pure. If you were an alcoholic, well, now you're sober. If you used to lie a lot, well, now you tell the truth. That's called repentance. You with me? Yeah. And yet, if those things haven't left our lives, you've got to ask, has Satan really left our lives? Wow. And right here, as Jesus cast this demon out of the guy, in verse 15, the people started to accuse Jesus of using the power of Satan to drive out Satan. And Jesus was like, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. Who would do that? I mean, even a worldly king wouldn't do that. I mean, can you imagine a worldly king going to war against another king? And yet before he goes to fight the other king, he goes and kills half of his own guys? That's the stupidest battle strategy I've ever heard. And evidently it was the stupid battle strategy that, that, that Jesus had ever heard. And he goes, Satan wouldn't do that. I know I wouldn't do that. Any kingdom divided against itself is going to fall. And that's true for God's kingdom. And that's also true for Satan's kingdom. And so if I'm not driving out Satan with Satan's power, then whose power am I driving out Satan by? The power of God. And if this is the power of God, then you've got to understand that this is the kingdom of God. And you've got to repent because the kingdom of God has really come upon you. Bottom line is God's kingdom transforms lives. God's kingdom transforms lives. You, you can say whatever you want to say, that you can go to any old group of people and they might share some philosophies and things like that and they might sound cool and they could be encouraging and this and that, but it really is the power of God to transform your life. Satan does not transform people's lives for the better. God transforms people's lives for the better. I'll never forget, there's this guy, when we were in Honolulu, his dad had become a disciple shortly there before, and his son, the, the, the dad, his, as a disciple, he came up to us and he goes, hey, my son's in really bad shape. And his son had been an alcoholic for a number of years. He had been addicted to cocaine and methamphetamine. His, he was married, but his wife wanted to leave him. And they had a little daughter together. Had been through rehab several times, but, but just couldn't change. Couldn't transform his life. And the dad comes up to us and he goes, hey, can you, can you please pray for my son? His marriage is in really bad shape. She wants to leave him and, and, and I don't know what's going to happen, but can you please just say a prayer for him? And so we said, well, we, we could say a prayer for him, but wouldn't it be better, you think, for us to go and try to study the Bible with him? And so we went, and he agreed, and we sat down with Dave. Dave was his name. And he studied the Bible one time. And after studying the Bible one time, cold turkey, he quits drinking. He quits doing drugs, all drugs. He repairs his marriage. And through that power, he ends up baptizing his own wife after he got baptized. He baptizes his two sons from another marriage. He baptizes his two sisters his two brothers, his mom, and he currently leads our sister church in Kona, Hawaii. That's not the kingdom of Satan. That's the kingdom of God. And when you see people's trans or lives transform, you can't help but to go, wow, God is moving. God is doing something right here in this guy's life. I'll never forget when I studied the Bible, I had, I had seen my brother transform, which is what motivated me to study the Bible. You see, I had grown up religious, but I had gotten to the point where I didn't believe that anybody could actually live like a Christian. Because all my friends that I saw in church were doing the same bad things that I was doing outside of church. And so over time, I, I didn't doubt the Bible to be true. And I believed in God, but I didn't believe that anybody could really live out Christianity. Because if the religious guys can't do it, then certainly me, who is pretty worldly, I could never do it. And so I had this thinking for a while 
But then when I got into high school and I just graduated, uh, my brother, who I always viewed as being way worse than me. See, I was a pretty rotten kid. But my brother, that was like another level of rotten. That was like, you know, there's the rotten fruit, but then there's the fruit that's no longer even like remotely the same color anymore. <laughs> that it's, it's turned black. And then there's the white mold that starts to grow on it. Like that, that type of rotten. And, and he, he, he was pretty bad. I mean, he was getting drunk every night. I mean, he was partying all the time. And, and I, I knew that I had my, my issues, but I go, man, that guy's got some issues. I mean, if Satan had a son, that's pretty much who my brother is. And I thought that way. And then, and then one summer after I'd graduated high school, he came back home uh, when I was living with my parents. And uh, we, we went to grab lunch. And so he made his lunch and I made my lunch. And we sat down at the table to eat our lunch. And just before we started eating our lunch, I look up and I see him praying for his food. And I was like, what the heck? What is going on right here? Like, dude, you are the son of Satan. Are you praying to Satan? Like, what, what's happening right here? And so I literally couldn't even eat. I just stared at him praying. Like, man, how long is this going to last for? And he's praying. And then eventually he rises up from his prayer that he said in his head. And he sees me staring at me or at him. And he goes, oh, I guess you're kind of wondering why I'm praying for my food. I go, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? And he goes, well, I've been meaning to tell you that part of the reason why I moved back in with mom and dad is because I've been studying the Bible and I really want to change my life. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to get baptized and I'm going to become a Christian. I go, oh, no, what? What? You know, you get that look like, what? And he goes, yeah, and I've been meaning to tell you, and I was going to invite you to come along. And I said, do you want to come and see it? And I go, absolutely. I got I to gotta see this. Like, what? And I'm thinking, like, okay, this is some kind of scheme. Is there must be a girl at church that he likes, or there's, there's some angle to this. Like, is he trying to rob the offering plate? Like, what, what's happening right here? And, and so I go to church, and, and much like our experience, when we first come to church, I'm getting hugged by everybody, and it's kind of throwing me off. Like, oh, it's like a little weird, man. Like, not used to guys hugging me. The preacher preaches, and at the end of it, I see my brother get baptized. And at this point, I'm like, whoa, he's really going for glory on this little charade right here. Like, what is he, what is he getting out of this? And for two weeks straight, I just watched him because I couldn't believe that his transformation was real. Because if his transformation was real, then it had to be God. And I couldn't believe that this was God. And so I watched him for two weeks, and sure enough, he had moved out of his ex-girlfriend's house. He had stopped partying and doing drugs and all the things that he was doing. And he really changed. And all of a sudden, he's all serious about studying the Bible all the time. I would wake up and I'd see him reading his Bible and praying. And I'm like, what is going on? And for two weeks, I was convinced he really changed. And then it hit me. If he could change, and he's the son of Satan... <laughs> Then surely I, who's not near as bad, that must mean that I could change. And all my excuses, you know when you try to like hold on to excuses, you're like, no. All my excuses started floating away. I'm like, no, no. And it's, we're gone. And I, and I was forced to go, all right, I got to deal with this. And so we're riding along in a car together. And I, I had it on my, my heart to ask I go, hey, Kyle, um, you know, are you guys still doing those Bible studies that you did that changed you? He's like, yeah. Why do you want to know? <laughs> I was like, well, no, I was thinking about doing some studies, too. Do you guys think you could do some Bible studies with me? And he was trying to play it cool, so he goes, yeah. I think we could probably try to work something out for you. Well, I studied the Bible for two weeks, and I transformed my life, and two weeks later, I became a disciple of Christ. Amen? <laughs> Let me tell you, when you see transformed lives, you go, this is the kingdom of God. This is not Satan. Satan does not transform lives. Satan destroys lives. But, but then Jesus goes on to tell this parable right here. And he starts talking about this strong man. And he says a strong man, you know, he, he really tries to guard his possessions and it requires somebody stronger to go in and tie him up and to steal his possessions from him. You go, man, this is pretty like ghetto right here for Jesus. I mean, what Jesus is talking about, stealing stuff right here, like, man, he's a thug. 
And what he's talking about right here is that, that the strong man is Satan himself. Remember the context is that Satan's demon was possessing someone. So he, the, the guy himself, the soul, was Satan's possession. And so he's talking about going and, and binding up Satan and stealing souls away from Satan. And he says right here that if you're going to steal souls away from Satan, you've got to first tie up the strong man and overpower him, and then you can take his plunder. Well, how do you tie up a strong man? You need a stronger guy. And here's the encouraging thing is Jesus is that stronger guy. Yes. And so when we go through God, and when we use the word of God, that we together can get past Satan, bind him up, so to speak, and steal souls from Satan's kingdom. Is that cranking or not? Yes. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, he says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. You see, we use the Bible as our weapon. That we can go in through the power of this scripture. This is not just some cool book that we like to read and carry around. We get our names engraved onto it. Look at my Bible. This is, this is an actual weapon that we get to use. That when we read the Bible, the Bible can transform people's lives. That it can bind Satan up and it allows us to, to get rid of all those crazy arguments that people make. To make their thoughts and their lives obedient to Christ. And then to steal that possession, that soul, back away from Satan and put them into God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. But look at what Jesus says right after this. He says, whoever's not with me is against me. Wait, what? Come on, Jesus. Come on. We don't have to be like with you, with you, do we? He goes, no, 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 there's no neutrality when it comes to serving God. You're either all in or you're not in. Whoever's not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. You see, there is no semi-gatherer or semi-scatterer. There is either gathering or scattering. And again... We understand that Jesus is talking about saving souls. See, Christianity is not about sitting around and trying not to sin. Have we, any of us tried that? Yeah. I've tried that a number of times and I've failed miserably every time. You're not going to be successful as a disciple if your whole mission in life is not to sin. Like, oh, here we go. Okay, don't think of the pink elephant. Mm, I thought about it. That, that's, that's not going to work. He goes, if you're going to be a disciple, then you've got to be about gathering souls. Well, let's read on in verse 24. What happens when you don't? It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, and isn't that what happens when we become disciples? It goes through arid places. So it's not talking about the disciple. It's now talking about the spirit. So once Satan leaves a, a person, they become a disciple. It says, the spirit goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. So if you thought that you're going to become a Christian and Satan was going to disappear from your life, you thought wrong. See, this is what happens. You become a disciple, you get baptized, and you go, man, life's good now. And then all of a sudden, boom! Like, whoa. Whoa, I just had a spiritual relapse. Man, I, I, I did the same thing I did before I was a Christian. What happened right there? That demon that left you came back and he found you not guarded already. Look at this, verse 25. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. And that is what a disciple looks like after they come out of the mess of being in the world. Right? You, you, you repent, you change, you get your life together, you, you resolve all your relationships, you've repented of all your sin, you've, so to speak, swept out all that garbage in your life, and you've put everything in order, and now you've got things pretty, pretty cranky. It looks like, as a disciple, you look like Vita's house. Like when you walk into Vita's house, things are well kept, swept, and put together. Vita's house is the perfect representation of a disciple. 
Now, if you want to look at what a worldly guy's house looks like, you just go to the brother's household. You with me? But the Bible says that spirit comes back in verse 26 and it says, then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So what he's saying right here is that the spirit comes back and and he sees that you've got everything all figured out, that you've swept your house, it's all cleaned up, that you're clean, and he goes, perfect. Because I've got seven friends that I'm going to bring along and we can't wait to just destroy the tar out of this thing. And they can come in if you've not filled up your house with something already. And they take over, and the condition at the end is worse off than the beginning. What's the point right here? If you don't fill up your life with gathering souls for God's kingdom, then those spirits are going to eventually come and work their way back into your life, and they're going to repossess you. In verse 27, it says that Jesus was saying these things. A woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And Jesus replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey. Stop being religious, lady. You're being so religious. Blessed is the mother who gave you birth. It's not about that. It's about obeying the word of God. And I think we've got to stop being so religious. Christianity is not about weekly meetings. It's not about a social club or a regiment that you put your life. It's not a discipline. Although those things are involved in Christianity, your life as a disciple has got to be about binding up Satan and going in and stealing souls for God's kingdom. Is that what you're all about? If you're not gathering, you're scattering. You know, one of my favorite movies is The Guardian. And it's uh, got Kevin Costner and Ashton Kutcher. And it's a movie about... The United States Coast Guard, but but an elite division in that Coast Guard where where there are rescue divers that go through the Bering Sea, which is one of the most challenging and roughest seas on the planet. And they rescue these, you know, sea uh, crab fishermen and fish fishermen that that just get stuck out in the the, the waves and the storms. And, And so here this guy is, Kevin Costner's character, who's like a legend in this world, who's rescued like tons of different people. And it's become famous because in one guy that he rescued, he, he literally held onto his hand from a helicopter with his fingers the entire trip back home because he couldn't pull the guy up. So he's just holding on for dear life. And so he became a legend of his field. And then you got this younger guy, Ashton Kutcher's character, who comes in and he just thinks he knows everything. An amazing swimmer, but he's looking to break every record that Kevin Costner ever set. And so he comes in and they kind of just have a rough go at things. But there's this point in the movie where, where they kind of bond finally, and Kevin Costner can clearly see the potential of Ashton Kutcher's character, but, but resents the fact that he's so arrogant and prideful about it. And, and, but they finally bond, and they have this like sobering conversation with each other, where Ashton, Ashton Kutcher, or Jake Fisher, he goes, hey, what's your real number? Like, what, how many people did you really save? What's your, what's your real number? And Ben Randall, Kevin Costner's character, he goes, 22. And Ashton Kutcher's just not impressed. 22? <laughs> I thought it was going to be like thousands, 22. And so Ashton Kutcher goes, well, 22, I mean, it's not bad. Not 200, but okay. And then Kevin Costner's character looks back and goes, no, no, no. 22 is not the amount I saved. Those are the amount that I lost. You see, I don't keep track of the ones I saved. I only kept track of the ones I lost. You see, in, his, in the story, his life was so consumed by saving people that he couldn't even keep track. There were so many that he saved. And the only ones that stuck out to him were the ones he lost. Is that our heart for God's calling and God's mission? If you're not gathering, you're scattering. My second point If you're not standing up, you're bowing down. If you're not standing up, you're bowing down. 
You know, later on, as I said earlier, God's people became exiled in Babylon. And it's at this point that Nebuchadnezzar as king has a dream. And we'll turn to Daniel 2. In this, this dream, he's greatly disturbed. And so he gets all his advisors and wise men together and astrologers. And he goes, okay, guys, I had a really crazy dream last night. I want you to tell me what this dream is all about. They go, okay, great. Well, tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it means. He goes, no, 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 no. If I tell you this dream, you guys are a bunch of liars. And you guys are going to try to trick me and tell me something that the dream doesn't actually mean. So here's the deal. You're going to tell me what I dreamed, and then you're going to interpret it for me. And, and just to give you a little nudge and some motivation, if you don't do that, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your families, burn your houses down, and pretty much erase you from the face of the earth. So these guys are freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, he's on to us. We really can't interpret dreams. He now knows that all the things that we've been telling him were lies, and he's going to kill us. We don't know how to do this, and this and that. And then finally, Daniel, as a man of God, prays. And God gives him the dream and the interpretation. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. You with me here? Yeah. In verse 31, it says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While well, you're watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So he, he explains to Nebuchadnezzar that in this dream was a giant statue of which was made from different metals. Of course, we understand that he goes on after this to explain and break down that this statue was represented by it represented different worldly kingdoms. And the head of the statue was Nebuchadnezzar himself, the Babylonian kingdom. And he tells us to Nebuchadnezzar right there in verse 36, he says, this is the dream and now we interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. And so in this prophecy, in this dream, we find different comparisons being made. Number one, the Bible refers to all these worldly kingdoms as an enormous, dazzling statue. And it refers to God's kingdom as a dinky little rock. And isn't that how it is? Some of us look at the Toronto International Christian Church and go, man, what a dinky little church. And yet we're enamored by the enormous, dazzling statue of the world. And so the Bible makes that comparison, but there's a second comparison that's not as obvious. In Colossians 1, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head. Well, here we find the worldly kingdoms, the statue, and who's the head? Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the head, the worldly guy. Well, let's see what Nebuchadnezzar does in chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come and to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the people, and the provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horde, flute, lyre, zither, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold, the world that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You know, I believe that we're faced with a choice. We can either bow down to the world or stand up for God. And right here, we, we find that Nebuchadnezzar stopped listening to the dream after the very first part where Daniel said, you're the head of gold. He really liked that part of the dream. He goes, you know what, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a statue in my own honor. And so he erects the statue in Babylon, 27 meters high. 
gold statue. And he goes, now I'm going to have everybody bow down to the statue. See, I don't like this whole concept of a kingdom coming and demolishing my empire. I want my empire to be king, to be God. And he forces everybody to bow down. And if you're thinking that this doesn't apply to you because we don't worship idols in our day, you'd be mistaken because in Ephesians 5.5 it says all immorality, impurity, and greed is idolatry. In 1 Samuel 15.23, the Bible even says arrogance is like the sin of idolatry. You see, the problem in this world is that everybody struggles to bow down to the, the idol. We're called by the world to bow down to the world. You know, it's been said, and I, I read statistics on this, very sobering, that North Americans, and even in, throughout the world, the world spends $16.9 billion on pornography a year. That's $2 per every person. Most of the world's population makes less than $2 a day. And yet $16.9 billion is spent on pornography every year. Every second, 28,258 people are watching pornography. 28,258 every second watching pornography, bowing down to the idol of impurity. 35% of all internet downloads are pornographic. Pornography use increases the chance for marital infidelity by more than 300%. That you are three times more likely to commit adultery if you watch pornography. Let's talk about greed. In the early 90s, North Americans were polled, what would you do for $10 million? 25% of those polled said that they would be willing to abandon their entire family. 25%, an additional 25, said they would abandon their church. 23% said that they would become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% said that they would give up their country's citizenship. 7% said that they would kill a total stranger. 16% 16% said that they would leave their spouses but not their kids, and 3% said that they would leave their kids but not their spouses. And this isn't a surprise. This is what people are doing, driven by consumers and bowing down to the idols of greed. And if you don't stand up for God, then you too are bowing down to the world. And so we find this in chapter 3, verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and announced to the Jews, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Not when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course. And his attitude toward them changed. He hoarded the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. 
come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. Why? Because you cannot deny the power of a transformed life. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor their hairs on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. See, it's one thing to not have any wounds. It's another thing to, to not even smell like fire. Anybody who spent any time next to a fire knows, man, you start smelling like the fire. It's like Subway. When you walk in a subway, you smell like subway for like a week. Are you with me? You can't get rid of that smell. And yet there was zero fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God, including the world, except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation, language, who say anything, against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, be cut into pieces, and their houses, you have a habit of doing this, bro. <laughs> and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. I would say that no other God can save, period. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Are you standing up or bowing down? Are you bowing down to the world or standing up for God? Let me tell you, God has all the money in the world. He's not impressed by money. He doesn't need our money. But every year, somehow, God allows us to go through the challenge of raising special missions contribution. And I believe that that's a test from God. Because when you have to, to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, I mean, the Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And unless you're willing to put your treasure into the kingdom of God, then you can't really say that your heart is in the kingdom of God. And if you're putting your treasure in the world instead of the kingdom of God, then your heart is now drifted away, and now you're worshiping and bowing down to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue and not bowing down and standing up for God. You know, I want to challenge us to live the way that Hadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived. To not be afraid of what could happen. For no other God could save in this way. No other God could save, period. What are you bowing down to? Worldly desires, your school, your career, families, friends. You see, none of that's going to save you. Only God can save. And so if you're not gathering... You're scattering. If you're not standing up, you're bowing down. We'll close with my favorite speech in my favorite movie of all time. It's from the movie Braveheart. And in this movie, you have the Scottish fighting against the English because the English are trying to get the Scottish to bow down to them. They're trying to get them to just assimilate into their way of thinking. And to just be ruled by the English and let the English do whatever they want. And so they're uh, brutally oppressing them and, and forcing them, even to the point where they're taking their wives and sleeping with them so that they don't have Scottish children, but they have English children. And so William Wallace's character, Mel Gibson, he rides up and he's not messing around anymore. He's ready to fight for his freedom. And they're lined up at war, and at this point in the movie, they're far outnumbered by the English. The English are outnumbering them like four to one. And all the people are looking at the forces of the English and they're going, man, we can't do it. And they're starting to want to walk away and give up. And then William Wallace's character rides in. His face is all painted blue. He's just ready for battle. All his key guys, their faces are painted, painted blue. And he's, he's riding in, but he's a little bit confused as to why the warriors that should be fighting for freedom are starting to walk away from the battle. And so he rides around and he rides up front and he says these words. He says, sons of Scotland, I am William Wallace. And then like a peasant soldier guy goes, William Wallace is seven feet tall. And William Wallace says, yes, I've heard. He kills men by the hundreds. And if you would hear, he'd consume the English with fireballs from his eyes and bolts of lightning from his, you know what. <laughs> he says, I am William Wallace. And I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You have come to fight as free men and free men you all. What would you do without freedom? Will you fight? And another peasant guy goes, fight against that. No, we will run, but we will live. And William Wallace says, aye, 
Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live. At least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now. Would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. And everybody goes, oh God, Baba Rubaba. What is that? But they go out and they just destroy the English. And I think the same is true for us. We've got to decide. Is living a lifetime in Babylon and dying in our bed many years from now with a bunch of stuff that we've devoted our life to that's worth absolutely nothing, would you be willing to trade all that from today till then for one chance to change the world? For this is our chance. Thank you. God bless. Amen.